Good morning, everyone. Um, let's kick off uh, our webinar this morning. Um, hope everyone is nice and warm. I know it's been raining a lot um, the last couple of weeks. Um, let me begin by um, acknowledgement of country. Um, I begin today by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land we gather on today. Um, I am on the land of the Darug people and pay my respects to elders, past and present. I, I extend that respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders uh, people here today. Um, let me introduce Madeline Winter and myself. Uh, my name is Kimia Kianyu. Um, I work for Ramwick City Council in the community development team. Um, we strive to provide with lots of different things um, for the community. And one of the projects um, uh, we do run is the Parenting Calendar, which um, operates in partnership with a number of different organizations um, to deliver such uh, programs and workshops um, as the one you're attending today for community in Ramwick LGA. Um, so today's webinar, we've got um, Madeline Winter here, um, and she's presenting on helping children learn. Um, and she'll talk uh, about that, obviously, during the webinar. Um, Madeline Winter uh, um, is doing this webinar, sorry. She also um, has her own business, Hand-in-Hand um, -hand Parenting. Um, and she's a, a and she's a parenting coach um, with over 20 years of experience. Is that right, Madeline? Yes. <laughs> um, just a little bit of housekeeping um, before we start. So there is going to be um, a post uh, attendee questionnaire at the end. So when you log off, um, it will pop up. Uh, the aim of this is to help us with um, future um, projects and workshops that we do run. Um, now, um, before I hand over to Madeline, um, obviously with this webinar, um, there isn't going to be interactions with you during because Madeline would be presenting, but I highly encourage you to pop any questions or um, anything that you have in the chat. Um, at the end of the webinar, I will um, address these questions um, when Madeline has finished her presentation. So without further ado, I pass it over to Madeline. Thank you, Madeline. Thank you, Kimya. <laughs> I'm always a bit amazed when this works. <laughs> so welcome to Helping Children Learn. Um, for parents of children six months to 12, it works differently depending on how old they are, but the principles are basically the same. And this is care of Google Translate. Feel free to get in touch with me and tell me that I have something wrong because I did not learn a second language, which I think is a disadvantage. But here we are, thanks to Google Translate. And I to acknowledge country. I'm sitting on the land of the Wongal people today. And I'd like to acknowledge that indigenous culture survives and thrives and that we've all gained from what they've lost. So, and as Kimia said, you're on silent. Kimia is my very able assistant. You can ask your questions at the end. Uh, I think it's the Q&A button. You can click and Kimia will make sense of your questions and she'll read them out at the end. And I'm always happy to hear from you. So my details, how to contact me are at various points in this webinar. And you should probably get an email afterwards from Ramwick City Council with some info about me. So I do like to start here though. We parents are very hard on ourselves. So the truth about you is that you are a good parent and you have always done the very best that you can. My daughter's 17, she'd say I was using exclamation marks like an old person, by the way. <laughs> And as a parent, you face very real struggles and difficulties, and then you're not to blame for these. There's things you're responsible for, but it's 
not your fault. The way things get set up around parenting are not thoughtful about parents and are generally not that's not thoughtful about young people. And we end up trying to handle that in the privacy of our own home. And we end up feeling like there's something wrong with us. I, I don't think I've met a parent who didn't some or other feel like there was something wrong with them. And we we almost it's 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 almost a liberation struggle, I think. We have to decide that it's not our fault because that just cripples us. And the last little bit is that someday you'll get a little rest. And here is my darling husband who chooses to do this on our friend's very comfortable couch when we go visiting. So, um, so after the webinar, you should get a recording. It may take a little while, but it will come. And you're welcome to book a short free consultation with me. I'm happy to find out a little bit more about you, answer your questions. So um, feel free to do that. My aim today is to um, talk a little bit about how humans learn. I want to talk about our special role as parents, which is different from teaching, which is why um, school from home has been so hard because those are two really different projects. Um, and about how you can keep connected with your child. I'll talk about building credit in a relationship bank account and about handling upsets, which are a key part and an important part of uh, trying to do new things and learning new things. So when you're handling upset, um, you're using credit from your relationship bank account. So I'll talk a bit about what that means. And uh, most important is about getting support for us as parents. We need a whole lot more help than we get. And we need somewhere where we can talk about the challenges and figure out the, the problems um, and uh, have space to vent, <laughs> really, amongst other things. So with the best of intentions, this little duck, I love this set of photos, this little duck has headed off with her little babies. She's very optimistic and she's encountered a challenge and she wasn't really planning for it and things don't go well. So we all make mistakes. Uh, my goal is to help you avoid and recover from the inevitable parenting fails. There's only a limited extent to which I think we can avoid them. We tend to have our attention on uh, trying to prevent things from happening and we forget and we often don't have really sharp tools for the process of repairing things when they've gone wrong, which includes helping our kids with the challenges that they've met around learning. So we can do a lot of work trying to set up the learning environment so that it works. But in the end, our, the key thing we can do is support our children to recover from experiences that have been hard so that they can pick themselves up and head off excitedly to the next one. So that's the goal. I have done many things. Um, I have done many things. <laughs> and I came to parenting quite late. And I say better late than never. It's the, it's the best thing I've done. It's not easy. Um, but happiness isn't just about doing easy things, I guess. I've been working with the hand-in-hand -hand approach for over 30 years for, for a long time with other people's children, which is different. And I got new perspectives when I had my own child and she's now 17. I was inspired to, well, you start sharing what you know with parents fairly quickly, but the main inspiration after years of, of working with, with, with other people's children was that uh, 
I felt like this framework made sense of everything that was happening. And my daughter really knew what to do. She knew how to get what she needed. She knew how to connect. She knew how to recover. And that was inspiring. And uh, it's good to connect with other parents. This is a way I've figured out to connect with other parents in a really interesting way. So a little bit about Hand in Hand Parenting. It was founded in the US. It spread all over the world. Um, we teach five listening tools, some tools for connecting, where we use child-directed play to build your relationship with your child, and um, special time and play listening are two of those play tools. Stay listening, listening to our children's upsets is also a very profound way to connect with your child. Today, I'm hoping to speak a little bit about special time and a little bit about stay listening. It's, I can't cover all of the tools here, though they're all really useful. So if you want to know more, get in touch and, you know, I can point you in the right direction. On the other hand is the idea of correction. So we set limits to resolve emotional tension and restore good thinking. So fundamentally, it's feelings that get in the way of people being able to do what they want to do. It's feelings ultimately that, that get in the way of being able to learn easily. And we teach some tools for resolving that emotional tension in your children, um, setting limits and listening to upsets. You can also learn to set limits playfully, which is different from generally how they were set for us. But it's incredibly powerful. Laughter is incredibly powerful for recovering from lighter fears and embarrassments. And there's a lot of light fear and embarrassment around learning. And we teach an adult to child tool. Um, which is called a listening partnership. It's where we get the support we need as parents. And you can set up listening relationships of one kind or another, where you get to be able to think about what you're doing, plan for what you're doing, get new understandings and perspectives on parenting, and most importantly, offload the places where you're tense, because that's a lot of what gets in the way of being able to have things go well is that we're pressed. So you might have come to this talk hoping I can help you figure out the maths homework. <laughs> I'm really no good at that, <laughs> it's turned out. I can't remember anything about high school maths, which says something, I did quite a bit of it. But actually, human beings are learning machines and we're learning at any age, whether it's from how to use a spoon, how to line up for class, how to play softball, how to do long division, how to catch a train, how to drive a car. That's where I'm at at the moment. And I mean, helping someone learn how to drive a car, which has tested me, I have to say, and how to be a parent. We're learning how to be parents. It's constant learning process because our kids are changing all the time and we're hardly on top of one bit before there's another bit. So, and it's important to understand, I mean, children love to learn. It's easy for them when things are not standing in their way. They learn several languages if they're exposed to them as young ones without really anyone giving them explicit instruction. They learn to walk. They learn to do all these amazing things before they're two even. And they learn from everything that happens to them. They learn in particular through play, and I'll talk about that a bit. They learn from others, including us, um, and through their own experiments, which is really important and doesn't happen as much as perhaps it could in formal learning environments. So it's not just about what happens at school. There's learning going on all the time. Um, 
I like to say that parenting is largely about limit setting. That's different from what we think when we hear that. We tend to think of limit setting as the thing that got done to us, which is wasn't always as gentle and warm and connected and kind as it could have been. Um, but it's as much about a constant learning process for us and our children. So I like this guy, John Medina. He's got a cute little book called Brain Rules. And he says that our learning performance may be deeply affected by the emotional environment in which learning takes place. So it's not about the maths. And it's very easy for us to get caught on the subject matter. Um, it's about the bank balance. Uh, what bank balance is that, you might ask? It's what I call the relationship bank balance. So there's a balance in your relationship with your child and the credit in that bank is connection. It's what greases the wheels of family life. And it, what it's a steep sense of connection is what al allows human beings to think well. So when there are a lot of struggles and limits, it's often a sign, and you're having to set a lot of limits, um, it's often a sign that the connection credit is low. And when things are close and there's a sense of cooperation and things are go smoothly, then it's a sign that the connection credits in your relationship bank, bank balance are higher. And just, I'll talk about this a bit later, but just to sort of, sort of flag, um, play builds connection and we need to focus on connection building and limits use connection credit. So we need to make sure there's plenty of credit in the bank if we're going to set limits. And broadly, I do a talk on helping children with school, and I'm not going to talk about that stuff here, but broadly, school has a lot of limit setting in it. So it chews up credit. Once our kids are at school, we really need to focus on replenishing the connection credit in the bank. So we need to keep the balance and some struggle in learning needs both correction which is limits and listening and it needs connection which you can do through play most effectively there are a lot of different ways to connect but we we use a particular kind of play that's very 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 efficient for building connection and when those things work in the right way together um, what what you get is space for learning is is a balance of connection and that's what we're after to learn well, um, young people fundamentally need to feel safe and wanted. And for that to happen, they need a lot of physical closeness and connection. They need play, preferably without that, you know, there's room for organised games and structured play experiences but very important to a child being able to figure out what they think about things is play without preset rules or competition. Open-ended play that's, that's actually um, um, directed by children. They need us to hold out relaxed high expectations. I'll talk about that in a minute. They need freedom from making mistakes, freedom to make mistakes. Um, so they need to be able to take risks and not be afraid they're going to be humil humiliated for that. That's how we learn. And they need a deep sense of respect and fairness, which as your child moves through school, you'll find I certainly these days need to listen to quite a lot of how hard it is to have been in a school system that it's, it's a great school, but there's still a lot of things that are just not fair for a whole bunch of reasons, I mean, many of which are to do with that there's just not enough teachers 
for the number of kids there and so things have to be organised in a kind of rigid way. But it's hard on young people and we're handling that at home. And along with connection, it's very important that young ones feel that their feelings are understood and that you're able to listen to them. You actually don't need to fix things up nearly as often as you think you do. What you really need to do is listen. That will help a child unload emotional tension, which gets in the way of learning. So I'll talk a bit about that. Just, this is not a talk about limit setting, but as I said before, I've come to the view that parenting really is all about setting limits, which doesn't mean you're mean and nasty and harsh and bossy all the time. Sometimes, <laughs> but not all the time. Um, it does mean that we're thinking about where our children need guidance, that we're building enough connection credits, that when we move in to provide that guidance, and that might be um, you need to do your homework. That might be, I know it's hard, but it needs to happen. Um, but, but when we need to provide the guidance, there's emotional safety there for our children to offload the feelings and be able to get on with what needs to happen. So the bottom line with young people when they meet a challenge is that if they could, they would. If they could, they would. They want the best for us. They want the best for themselves. They want the best for each other. But feelings get in the way of thinking. And our response needs to be one that, that's warm. We need to set warm limits. And what I like to frame as relaxed high expectations. Young ones need high expectations. We need, they need us to to hold out that they're capable of amazing things. I think young ones in our culture are chronically underestimated and it's very demoralizing for them. But the problem with expectations is when they get tense, um, when we are tense and children feel bad if they don't reach those expectations. And just a reminder that setting limits, which often learning um, involves helping helping our kids learn involves setting limits that uses connection credit so we need to figure out how to build that credit if there are limits to be set so there's a girl in a kayak with a challenge but she looks pretty relaxed so relaxed high expectations rather than tense high expectations which by and large, we got met with tense high expectations and it tends to be what we reach for. Um, but it's important to have expectations, but we need to be relaxed. When young people feel connected, um, they can use their thinking brain and they need connection like air, food or drink. It's deeply, deeply important to good human functioning. And play is one of the most profound ways that young ones connect. It's extraordinary. I found it surprising when I had a little one. It's like she would come in from a day out and before she would be prepared to eat anything, before we could get to the toilet when she was little, she would come home and she would have this deep need to just play. And that's um, quite a lot of what got played, which is um, uh, figuring out, I don't know, play, play, imaginative play. They're busy cooking there. There was a lot of cooking. So play is how children make sense of the world. It's how they experiment and try new things. It's a key way for them to communicate with you they can show what they're interested in and show what they're feeling, both good and bad. So, you know, they can, they'll show you what they're worried about in what they choose to play. If you let them choose, that's the critical piece is that you let them choose, at least sometimes. It's how they make friends and connect with us. If you use 
the listening tool called Special Time, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, if you use that tool with a young one, if you've, you've never met before, you'll be their fan for life. So I've done special time once with my neighbor's child and she, I'm in there. Um, she greets me warmly. She leans over the balcony to chat with me. We're connected. And it was just one special time where it was timed and my job in that time was to follow her lead. So it's a great way to make friends and it grown-ups could probably use a bit of it actually um, but it also allows children to tell that we care about them and in fact um, play is not frivolous at all um, the American Academy of Pediatricians say it's essential for the cognitive physical social and emotional well-being of children and youth and it's also a human right defined in very interesting ways in the Convention on the Rights of the Child. In particular, they talk there about adult support of free play as being one of the things that brings most benefits. And that's play where children initiate control and organize the play. So they'll play at school. They'll do this sort of play in the school round. They won't generally get to do it as part of a formal schooling. And they're going to be backed up. They need to do this. And it's especially um, efficient if sometimes, not all the time, you can't do it all the time and it doesn't make sense to try. But sometimes if you join them in that endeavour. And the listening tool that is most powerful for that is called Special Time. It's an incredibly good way to build connection credits in your relationship with your child. It's an adult to child playtime. Play it's one on one. So if you have more than one child, you'll need to figure out how to schedule this so that everyone gets a turn. Once kids understand it, they're generally able to be cooperative around letting someone else have special time. But you may need to figure out how to do it when the others aren't around. My experience with families that have more than one child is that you actually do better once you, because you have to schedule it, it, it sticks. Those of us who only ever had one child, it's, it tends to drop off because we don't have to schedule it. So you let your child show you what they want to do. You time it, five, 10, 20 minutes. You don't need to do longer than that. You've got to be able to have the length of time you're playing with your child be um, how long you can, can last with an absolute commitment to giving them your full attention. So I have to put the phone in the boot practically. Um, I really noticed the difference when, when smartphones happened. Um, my parenting has spanned that period of history and I noticed how much more distracted I am. They need our full attention. They need to know how long they've got us for and how long they can use our attention. They'll feel deeply connected to you if you can play with them in this kind of way. And they will um, tell you things through their play and it builds their confidence and their resilience in really remarkable ways. It's a superpower, I think, special time. It does all sorts of things. But if your child's up against some learning problem, you can do special time for 10 minutes. Don't mention the learning problem. It's not your agenda in special time. It's them getting to freely use their mind as creatively as they want. And it often means they can come back to the learning task, the more formal learning task, with a bit of slack um, that makes it easier to do it. Especially after a day at school, it's hard on kids to come home and have to do more. I could talk for hours about what I think about homework, but um, it's hard on kids to have to do more. So a bit of your undivided attention after school is going to help. And feelings, emotional tensions, get in the way of learning and of making friends. So when your child feels disconnected, um, they can't learn. They're in their feeling brain and trying to reach them with reason and argument and instructions and orders 
<laughs> often doesn't work when they're in that place. So we need to find a different tool for reaching them when they're in that place. Why do feelings get in the way? What happens is that stressful experiences, and they can be really experiences we can tell are stressful as adults. You know, a child had a traumatic injury or a really difficult birth. We can tell that that would have been traumatic or something happened in the family. But it's it's pretty hard being young in the world. It's not difficult for a child to, to accumulate stresses just like us. And um, feelings tend to migrate and collect more feelings on their way. They snowball and they drive what we call off-track behaviour. So when a reasonable expectation is held out and around homework, I think you have to ask whether it's reasonable, but assuming that what it is that needs to get done or what it is that that needs to be learnt is is reasonable. Um, when when that can't, when your child can't do that, um, they'll show you in a range. Well, when they're carrying emotional tension, actually, they'll show you in a range of off track behaviours. And one of them may be that they can't learn anything. Um, yep. We need to remember that it is really hard being a young person in the world. People don't really ask young people's opinions <laughs> and they have plenty of opinions and often their perspective on things is really much fresher than ours um, and much more flexible than ours. It's very, very hard not to, to be living in a world that doesn't routinely include your perspective on things. And one of the ways that young ones will show that they're carrying emotional tension is they'll have big feelings about um, little things. And little learning challenges can be a, a, a hook off which they hang a whole bunch of big feelings. So a friend of mine's daughter is learning a musical instrument. My friends come to the point where what she's decided she needs to do is cheerfully remind her daughter about what, about the practice that it's hard for her to get to practice. And I have to say, I started learning a musical instrument as an adult and it's really hard. You are pushed when you don't know how to do something and you're struggling, you don't yet have the skills. There's this, it's quite uncomfortable feeling as you push yourself up against trying to learn something new. So my friends decided that cheerful reminders and if her daughter comes home from school, and can't do the music practice and she offers some cheerful, relaxed, high expectations, honey, it's time now to do the music practice. Sometimes what will happen is a big upset. And my friends told me about how often what comes out in that upset is a whole lot of stuff about what happened today at school. Often it's about, you know, she got yelled at by a teacher or something was unfair. And that needs to get vented. And the, and the music practice, the, the task of coming, to, coming up against learning this thing um, brings her up against those feelings. And if we can just know that and confident, be confident that listening to it and holding out that the learning needs to happen, um, some big feelings will come up and can be got rid of because they're getting in the way. One of the problems with uh, our feelings are that they don't actually go away because we stop them. So we live in a culture where generally I think we think that if you stop crying, you stop being sad. But actually, um, tears are the way we release grief. So there's a number of ways that human beings offload emotional tension and um, tears release stress and grief. Tantrums actually release frustration. They're not well understood in our culture. I'm not sure they're understood well in, in, in any culture. But that fast, hot, furious 
upset that is a tantrum, if you can actually hang in there and stay warm and close while a child has that tantrum and not try to shut it down, it is the release of this intense feeling that is frustration. And I think as adults, we often don't embark on really fresh new learning experiences and, and forget what it's like to be up against that feeling of frustration when you haven't mastered something. And sometimes I've struggled to sort of think about what is that feeling? Um, it's, it's the feeling you get when your computer won't work and you cannot figure out how to make it work and you need it to work and, and what you'd like to do is throw it through the window. That's how people feel when they're up against something they can't do yet but that they want to do. Just to give you my regular experience <laughs> of feeling frustrated but if you if you could have that tantrum and grown-ups have ways of having tantrums but we we sort of pretend it's not but children don't pretend yet which is a wonderful thing about working with young ones the other thing to know is that he, um, laughter is incredibly important at healing lighter fears and embarrassments. And I, as a young person, there's a lot of new things you have to embark on that you've never done before. It's a bit scary. And you need to feel that fear and keep going. Sometimes if you don't get to feel that fear, you're sort of consumed by tim timidity and embarrassment that holds you back from doing everything that's possible to do. Um, and that's a feeling and we can help our children with that. So if we can listen to tears, if we can hang in there warmly with a tantrum, if we can figure out how to get our children laughing, we're there in charge. Just a little note, tickling doesn't work because children are not in charge. They actually need to be in charge. You're the safety manager, but they need to be in charge. Those things restore thinking. And on the other side of it, if we can do those things well enough, they're in the category of what we call stay listening, um, then our children will be able to do what they couldn't do before they had the upset. The upsets are good is the short version. So this is the listening tool that we teach to help you hang in there with your kids when they're upset. You want to make things safe. You want to move in close and pour in your love. Don't criticize, don't try and correct, don't try and give them information. Their mind is in their feeling mind, not their thinking mind, and they need to be there and you need to hang in there with them while they move through it. At, on the other side of it, they'll be able to make sense of whatever information you need to give them. They pour out their feelings and stopping the crying doesn't stop the feeling. And this is an important thing around helping our kids with learning experiences. Um, don't jump in to fix it. I think sometimes the learning challenge is technical and we can we need to set up a bit more support for young ones around learning stuff than they get in school generally. So sometimes there's a technical problem that there is a fix for, but at least as well and sometimes really much more important is, is the bunch of feelings your kids having about what it is they're trying to learn, whether it's tying their shoelaces. Most of us have had that experience where our children are absolutely determined to try and learn how to do something. They won't, actually, if they've got their wits about them, they won't let us help them. Um, they want to figure it out for themselves, but they need to feel very frustrated about how hard that process is. So we feel very tempted as parents to jump in and fix stuff. Um, and there's really, there's a place for it, for checking that there's not something really wrong about the learning environment, for, for example. But a lot of the time, the thing we really have control over, we can't control who the teacher is. Often we can't control what the tone of the school is. But we can listen to our kids when they get home. We can play with them and connect with them. And we can listen to them, offload their upsets. They, so they can handle this experience that they're, they're in the middle of. It's actually not easy for us um, to provide that kind of connection with our children, unfortunately. When our kids meet trouble, we feel really troubled too. 
one of the things that tends to happen is that we confuse our experience as young ones with the experience that our children are having. So the other day I had a parent worrying about her her child's capacity to make friends. And there may be some things there that you might want to think about together with a classroom teacher who knows your child well and who understands what it's like for children at that age so can put their struggle in perspective. Um, but it was pretty clear to us both that most of what this mum was feeling was to do with how hard it had been for her. And a lot of the time, um, it's about how hard it was for us. Uh, I can tell the story about what it was like when my daughter went to school. And as a non-parent, it turns out, I'd kept away from school. <laughs> Once I left, <laughs> but as a parent, you, you have to do stuff that you might not otherwise have chosen to do. And the nanosecond my daughter started at school, turns out the schoolyard and the school building were built in the 1880s and looked almost exactly, a lot of schools in Australia must have been built um, around then um, in some of the older suburbs in in the cities and um and that school looked awfully like the one I went to the walls are the same horrible sort of pink institutional pink color anyway I was thrust into a very uh, I was really stressed and I know enough about this process to sort of think uh, I don't know whether this is really about what's happening to my daughter or whether it's pulling up something for me. It turned out it was pulling up something for me. And I have what we call listening partnerships. I go and talk about this and what it turned up actually, what it was, it was pulling up memories of the actual school that I went to where I'd had a very hard time. But that was then connected to having to start school in a foreign country where I didn't speak the language. So that had been intensely stressful. Uh, in fact, so stressful that I didn't really remember it as an important emotional event in my life. But it wasn't until my daughter went to school, suddenly I'm thrust into the middle of it. So our children meet trouble, we feel trouble too. We're under pressure as parents. So it's hard for us sometimes to have the space to listen both time-wise and emotionally, we need support. And we were learners too. So we all have memories about um, what our own learning experiences were like, which will be pulled up. The human brain um, works in this really interesting way. We look at what's in front of us. We go back to find out what we already know about it, which will often be stuff to do with when we were young. We're not aware often that this is what's happening. And we pull up, sometimes what we pull up is really useful information, even if it's information about how this is different from how it was then. But if there's emotional tension contained back there, um, then what we pull up is a whole big bunch of feelings that confuse what, what's going on now. So we were learners as well. and. Um, for some of us, that was generally an easy process. And it's actually very useful to talk about all the fun times you had learning stuff. And it can be, uh, it could, it, it it's, was also for many of us a time that was actually very hard. And those feelings will get pulled up as well. So the listening tool that you can set up for yourself here or you can join a group. I run um, what we call support calls, where are very small, four is my max group of parents. We get to work through, um, we, everyone gets a chance in each meeting to talk about something that's going on or something they'd like a hand with. And then we all get what's called listening time, where we get a chance to, without being judged, without being interrupted, we get a chance to 
um, process, think about, plan, and notice some big feelings sometimes um, about whatever the challenge is that we're trying to manage as a parent. Very, very handy. I have several listening partnerships. I don't go to the movies with my listening partners. I just do this with them. And it, it's incredibly useful. So a listening partnership is where you find a partner and you take turns listening to one another about your experiences. In this case, it's very useful to talk about learning. Um, I taught my husband, so you don't always want to make listening partners of your friends. It's different from a conversation and there's, it needs to be confidential in a way that's difficult to manage with friendships. But my husband and I have a listening partnership. We've agreed on what we're not going to talk about because sometimes we hit hot button topics and we forget we're supposed to be listening. But um, one of the things we've regularly done, swap time listening to one another about is how, how does parenting now remind me of when I was this age? So when my daughter was six how, how what what do I remember about being six being teenagers is a really big deal a lot of us had quite a hard time through teens and that comes up in ways it, it influences us in ways we're not necessarily aware it's very useful to take turns five minutes each way 10 minutes each way don't interrupt let the other person tell their story and then swap over and tell yours and then it's important not to mention it afterwards, which is where it can get tricky if you're married to somebody. But anyway, um, but you can usefully talk about what are your memories of learning? What was school like for you? And a biggie for many of us, what was homework? How do you feel about homework? And, and what was it like for you? I, I haven't, I'd have to say one of the hardest spots, which is a bit of a shock for me, um, one of my hardest places to stay rational has been around homework. I just, I must have had to do a lot of it on my own as a young person and without any help. And, it, you know, it's, it's hard for me not to get really tense about it. And I have to tell you, I'm not the only parent. So I need to talk about homework hassles a lot. So just to summarise, um, we're keeping the balance here. We need to add credit to our relationship bank balance. We need to connect through play and special time is a really good way to do that. We use credit when we hold out that our child can persist when they've bumped into a feeling of difficulty around learning something. That's a limit and it uses credit. It's really important. We have to set limits. We have to hold out relaxed high expectations. You can do this, sweetheart. I know you can work out this maths problem. I know. I know it's hard. Yeah but we're going to do it. I know you can do it. That's stay listening. And to keep holding that limit, a you're going against a child's will. Um, so you've got to do that as a parent a fair bit of the time. So it's important that there are other times where they really know you're on their side. So special time, will give them a place where it goes their way. It's timed because you can't go their way 24-7. It's actually not helpful to even to do that. It's not possible, <laughs> but it's also not helpful. It needs to be special time. Um, but that gives them a deep sense that you're on their side. Um, it will also give you insights into what's going on in their life that they wouldn't necessarily sit down and tell you but they'll show you through their play and it builds the credit that's sitting there waiting to get used when you need to say sweetheart it's time to try doing that music practice 
Um, we, we also build deep connection with our children through listening to their upsets. So rather they'll, they'll, they might be quite volatile and they get upset. They'll often, we call it freedom of the mouth. They'll often say things that they don't mean. And when they're in that place, it's really important not to take it personally. They're just looking, they're thrashing around and they're not thinking. Their thinking mind is not driving the show. So they'll be quite, they can be quite volatile. If we can just hang in there and not take it personally and know that it's a storm that will pass. It's a bit doubtful today because we've got a lot of rain here, but it will pass and on the other side of it will be sun. And the other thing is just to recap that we need a whole lot more support than we get. And we barrel into parenting without there really being any, generally any sense that we need to learn stuff about it before we get there. It's incredibly complicated work. I remember going back to work after having a period off after I'd had my child and it's like, oh my God, the world of work is really easy. People abide by the rules. <laughs> and if they don't, they have to leave. So, you know, it's really complicated work. It involves thinking about other people in ways that we might not have had to do. Um, it involves organising resources and support. Um, it's not well supported and we need a place where we can talk about how that feels and figure out what the next step is without feeling like we're going to just be loaded up with someone else's advice. Advice is usually someone trying to tell their own story. It, it, it's, it's occasionally really useful, particularly when you've asked for it, but a lot of advice is unsolicited. You didn't ask for it. And um, it's often not helpful because it's actually a person trying to tell you what they figured out. You need a place where you can figure stuff out. And one of the things you might need to figure out is where you can go and get some support and resources. But you need space to do that without having someone else's opinion sort of forced on you. So I'm kind of at really near the end, um, you can get, you need support. You could find a listening partner. You could join one of my support calls. You could come and have a short chat with me and we can figure out what it is that might be most helpful to you. So that's my little talk, rather long talk, but anyway. Thank you, Madeline. It was, I, I'm person. I'm not a parent myself and I learned so much. <laughs> Thank you. Huh, well. Being a good <laughs> auntie. I'm, I'm, I forgot to in the beginning apologise if my fur babies barked, but they didn't, so it was good. Oh. <laughs> We're, We're all working from home. <laughs> Thank you so much. That was, that was so, so informative. Um, and I highly recommend everyone... Um, uh, you know, as Madeline mentioned, you will get an email with her details. Just, um, you know, follow up on this and um, with the free short consultation, you know, and, and um, yeah, use that. And I guess you, you've given all your details so they can just get in contact with you as yeah. well. Yeah. Yep. Um, I'm just looking um, at the chat. And look, if you've got any questions, um, feel free to pop them in now. We can... Um, can answer any, any questions they, that you have. We can address um, Madeline, and this is a good opportunity to do that. I think Elmira mentioned that the, the forestry and the welcome was perfect. I think in the beginning you were oh. saying <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. Got, got one feedback there. <laughs> good old Google Translate. <laughs> That's very cute. <laughs> I can see that question. So someone's asked, um, what if a child wants to play a computer game as their special time? Is that okay? This is such a common question. Um, so the answer is overall, yes. 
Um, there's a few things to say about screens. One is, uh, well, the first thing to say is about special time. So if you are building, we call it a special time relationship. And what you want to establish with that relationship is that you really are on your child's side. So at least at first, um, you really need to do what they want to do with you in special time. So I think if what they want to do in special time is, is screens, your challenge is to we, we use screens for babysitting, which is, I'm a big fan of the strategic use of screens. Like if, if there's times where you just can't pay attention um, and you need them to be under control, screens are great. Um, but if, yeah, so I'm not against screens. Um, if they want to do screens in special time, at least initially, I think you need to say yes. The challenge is not to move into just um, passively, like using it like babysitting. You need to, in special time, you need to really be in there with them. I'm old. <laughs> Hopefully many of you will have figured out to have children younger than I did. Um, but probably for most of us, our experiences of screens are really different. The, the, the way we grew up with screens is really different from the way our children are experiencing it. And it's one of those places where I think it's really easy to assume that your experience is the same as your child's. And the reality is that they are connecting through screens, that they are um, learning a whole lot about the world. Some of it's terrible, but a lot of it's wonderful. Um, just wonderful. So I think you have to assume that your child will be want, quite possibly wanting to share this really interesting part of their life with you. And there'll be things in there that they may want to share with you because they don't make sense fully but I think if you just say blanket no you've lost an opportunity that's a very natural opportunity for connection what people find is that over time it's kind of it can be hard to not just be passive in the screen watching if you've gone their way around screens and you've done your best to hang in there and you've got to a point where it's it looks like it's just a holding pattern and it's just another chance to watch screens get in touch with me we'll have a short chat and I'll give you some pointers but certainly at the beginning it's important to do what they want you to do the other little story I'll tell is um, a friend of mine's kid went to a play date um, the girl was about about seven so it's quite young and came home and the first thing she wanted to do was watch a YouTube video and my friend was inclined to say uh, no but because it's special time she said yes and what she wanted to watch at seven years old was a music video which which as soon as they started watching it my friend understood why she why her daughter wanted to watch it because it wasn't explicit in 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 the images the sexual images that were in it but there were definitely sexual themes there that just didn't make sense to a seven-year-old her daughter watched it it was as if she needed to work through it with the reassurance of her mum being there. And after that, her mum reported she never went back to it. So the take we had on it was that there was something in there that didn't make sense to her. She needed to borrow her mother's confidence and reassurance to work through it again. And then she could drop it. If it had had something that had laid in a bigger chunk of uh, emotional tension, which wouldn't be hard. You know, there's a lot of stuff in a lot of screen stuff that won't make sense to young, especially young children, especially young children who don't understand about a story arc and that something horrible happening at the beginning gets worked through in the story and everything's happy in the end. Like that's actually, we learn that that's how a story goes and we can learn to put difficult things in context. But before a child's ready to do that, 
those images can be quite distressing and you do want to be really careful about what your kids are watching but if it had been a more stressful if it had laid in a, a nasty little knot of emotional tension and confusion probably what would have happened is that child would have come back to it again in special time and that tells you something it tells you my child has some tension here and then you can think about okay how do I work with this so that she can rid, rid herself of that tension but just because they want to watch screens doesn't mean you should say no thank you Madeline the, the, the questions are all running in now <laughs> um the yeah, second yeah, one yeah. Um, what if my child actually wants to include their sibling in their own special time? Yeah. Um, I think that if they want to have a play time with you with their sibling, it's not special time. So special time is is one on one. It's this information superhighway from them into you. And they need not to have to compete with their sibling around that. Um, so you you may need to, at least at first, while everyone's getting the hang of it, you may need to figure out how to have one of them have something more interesting to do or be somewhere where they're not in, in the vicinity. Special time can be tricky when there's more than one kid around because it looks like a really cool thing. And any child, like I, I got to the point where I wouldn't do it in a park. Um, I would call it park time <laughs> because pretty well every kid in the playground wanted to be part of the story it, it just looks like a, an adult who's interested and engaged and looking to have fun and not take over that's incredibly attractive to young people so I think generally it's hard to do if there's more than one child around and you'll need to figure out how to have times when each child is getting you fully and they don't have to share the other thing to say is that tensions between siblings are are often the first challenge the, or the first thing that needs to happen is each of them needs to get one-on-one -on -one time with you and that's best and most efficiently done especially when they're young um, it, with special time which is one-on-one. -on -one. If a child, if you set up special time and whatever it is you set up, a child has to have a big upset about it. So it may be that some big feelings need to get offloaded around the idea of not doing it with the sibling. And that's fine. If, if that's what comes up when you propose special time, that's, that's not a fail. It's just a bit of tension that needs to be offloaded and the, the relaxed high expectation your hand, you're holding out is, we'll get to do special time together. I know you really want to be with your brother. I know. But we're going to do special time, just you and me. And that's, that may be an upset that needs to happen. But there'll be, when children don't want to do something that makes sense, there's always a reason. Um, and setting the right limit around it will pull that to the surface if that makes sense thanks madeline um elmira has asked uh should we set up a timer for special time um my daughter hates timers um and she's commented that um she's used them in the past and it's it's kind of made her like hurry up to do something yeah i think it's important to know exactly how long she needs to know how long she has you otherwise she I didn't talk about this a lot but basically special time one of its the amazing things it does is build emotional safety into our relationship it's the cushion that will um, help us repair when we've made mistakes so the little duck at the beginning <laughs> so um if she doesn't know how long she's got you it's a bit like trying to tell your deepest secrets to someone who might any minute have the phone ring and have to go you you really wouldn't feel safe to tell your secrets so she needs to know how long she's got you i think if you've used timers in a way that's built 
that's accumulated some emotional tension around it, that may be the thing that a few upsets need to be had about before you can get to a point where you can comfortably both turn the timer on and um, take 15 minutes and then have the timer end and uh, finish special time. So I think that's just... Again, I'd hold out a relaxed high expectation that we're going to have 20 minutes and we'll put the timer on. And if she gets to have upsets about that idea, she's actually offloading the tension that she accumulated earlier through the way you used a timer. We, 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 we understandably as parents end up sort of trying to avoid upsets. And I'm all for that, but what tends to happen is that ultimately, like I said earlier, upsets tend to snowball, emotional tensions tend to snowball. So over time, they'll get bigger and it will get harder and harder to work around them or work with them. And there's a point at which it's almost easier to, to meet it head on than to try and work around it. So she's carrying some tension about you having hurried her along with the timer. Um, this is a great opportunity for her to offload that so that she can um, relax uh, with a certain amount of time to do something with you. And one of the things she may do, this is common at the beginning of special time, one of the things she may do is when the timer goes off, children can have a big upset um, early on usually in the special time relationship once they get the hang of the fact that it's going to happen regularly it's not such an issue but early on they'll they'll often have big feelings about special time ending and they'll want to keep playing and it's fine sometimes to say sure if you've got five minutes extra put the timer on for another five minutes but that upset about it ending is actually another big ups you know a, a big upset about no, a little upset about a big thing. <laughs> so it's like children have to end things all the time when they, they didn't want to. If they'd had a choice, they would have kept going. So they accumulate um, a lot of tension around comings and goings and endings. And the end of special time can be an opportunity to, to listen to your child about how they feel about that. So sometimes go their way, put it on for another five minutes at the end. But sometimes say, no, sweetheart, we're going to stop and be ready. In fact, if, if you know your child tends to have that upset at the end of special time, if you've got 20 minutes, do special time for 10 so that you're prepared to listen to the upset at the end of it. It's going to be very useful. It's draining emotional tension around something which is probably giving you and your child trouble in all sorts of other places in your day where where things have to end um so yeah cool thank you madeline um i've got another question here can you give an example of how to cheerfully remind in doing chores and homework? Okay. <laughs> chores and homework. Popular question. <laughs> I, I, I know. I moderate a, a Facebook group for Hand in Hand in the US for parents of teens and chores in particular are um, one of the big issues, which is actually, I didn't talk about this earlier. I'll just say a little bit now. It does change a bit as our children get older, how we navigate setting limits and listening to upsets. Little ones still have the offloading process very handy. You know, children are born knowing how to have a big cry when they need to. They know how to have a big tantrum when they need to. But our culture... Um, discourages it and actually sometimes punishes people for doing that and so by the time a kid is 12 or 13 or 14 or even eight um, they've got the message that they need to keep things under control so when you can tell there's something bugging them it can be um, it, it's a more complex process sometimes of getting to the point where they can offload those feelings and often it's scrappy <laughs> and usually pointed at us. That's, you've really got to not take things personally. 
um, the older they get, uh, the more they tend to make it our fault, which it is sometimes part of it. That's the other thing. So there's a bit of history. So chores is a tricky one. It gets really tricky for older parents of older kids because our kids are bigger and we actually get hoodwinked into thinking they're functioning like adults. And actually the, the sort of adolescent brain is not well organised generally. There's bits that come online at different times from other bits and um, they probably won't remember uh, what it is that needs to be done. I think chores is this huge issue. I think most of us have a recording from our own childhood of people being really tense about, because, because our parents were hardworking and didn't get enough help. And parenting is such a lot of work. When you've got someone standing in front of you who's big enough to do it for themselves, quote, unquote, <laughs> um, um, it's hard not to get shitty that they're not doing it. Um, so I think the general policy we have to take is that they won't remember and we have to remind them. And if we remind them from a place where we're upset and cranky and angry, we aren't actually helping them. We're just dumping our feelings on them. And those feelings are often about how tired we are. And they can't help how tired we are. You know, they, they probably would if they could, and they can't. So I think we have to decide to take a tone. Honey, the, I mean, honey, we need to, I don't know. I, I don't want to get into homework because it really is complicated. I think a lot of what gets handed out for homework really do, doesn't, doesn't need to be done and it's not hard to find a teacher who admits that a lot of what gets handed out is only being handed out because they think parents expect it and some parents do but say getting chores done around the house sweetheart um you know it's time to put the bin out I know you don't want to but it's time to put the bin out just cheerful matter of fact not well you know how it could go <laughs> you know that's not going to help the other thing is that um children are built for connection and uh we've learned to do a whole lot of stuff on our own we, we've almost we've had to do that so much we think it's normal it's not normal Human beings function better in connection and function differently in connection with other human beings. Um, I often quote this study about twins in utero and they've studied the movement patterns of the twins and they discovered that they, their movement patterns were different when they were interacting with each other than when they were interacting with their home, which was the lining of the uterus, like their mum's body but their mum's body was was their home and and their patterns of movement were different from when they were connecting with each other we're primed to connect with the other human being who's in the room and doing jobs on our own isn't much fun so sometimes I think the way around chores maybe I need to do a whole webinar on chores that's a good idea <laughs> that might be the next one so Sometimes around chores, we need to decide that we'll do it with them. Um, I'm still doing it with my daughter a lot of the time. Not all the time. But I think if we, it's important not to have unrealistic expectations because they, we get disappointed and then that gets in the way of figuring out what actually needs to happen so our kids can do it, if that makes sense. We feel very justified. We, whenever we feel justified, it's actually a little red blinking light, to be honest. It's like we feel very justified in, in having a tantrum about the fact that they haven't taken the rubbish out. And it's understandable, but it doesn't help. So it's a long answer to a short question. It's a big topic. It is. It sounds like a very interesting one that, you know, maybe we need to 
12 into yeah, yeah. 11. Yeah, I'll think about so um, sure. Next question. Okay. Um, you mentioned um, laughter heals fear. How do you get laughter in when they're having a tantrum? Would it seem like you're ignoring their feelings? Yes. So with laughter, the first place to start, there's a couple of things to say about it. It's, it's very difficult for us to, to respond playfully if we're exhausted. So the first thing to say is we actually need to tend to ourselves and get a place where we can talk to someone about how hard it is in order to be, to have, for most of us to have the range, you know, the flexibility to respond playfully. Um, that's what we need. Um, and playfulness is a perfect way to handle chores problems. Like if you go at the chore full, full pelt and, and manage to do it really badly, um, chances are you'll get a laugh out of your child and that breaks the tension around the whole thing. For instance, as an example of where sort of moving in a limit setting direction, but playfully is very powerful. When a child's having a tantrum, they need to have the tantrum. Um, you don't need to do anything except keep things safe. Sometimes you need to keep things safe around that kind of real physical offloading um, and stay warm. It's, it's not personal. They, they don't want, actually in a tantrum, they don't want um, the worst for you. They're just offloading this extreme sense of frustration. And we just need to hang in there. I know, sweetheart. I know. You don't want to put your shoes on. I know. When we're doing that kind of listening, we talk about five words or less. If you're saying more than five words, you're probably reaching for their thinking mind and it's not there. So if you can keep, if you can just remember, if I'm saying more than five words, I need to shut up. It, it helps keep things re reaching for the right part of your kid's brain. But when they're in the middle of a tantrum, they just need to have the tantrum. Tantrums are hot and fast. They're generally not personal. And on the other side is a very different child. When a child is working through fear, it's a bit more complex. But either way, um, if a child's really upset, I wouldn't be going for laughter. But before they got to that place, I mean, the thing, what I started to say was a good practice is to notice what makes your kids laugh and then encourage it. And children need to do a lot of laughing because there's a lot of little things to be a bit scared about. Um, there's a reason, for instance, that kids set up a little laugh fest in, in the back seat. And they're, well, that's a whole other story. But, you know, they'll be laughing about things you can't understand why they're laughing. Or they'll be laughing about things that are to do with um, commonly that kind of laugh fest is about farts and bodily functions. And what young people are laughing about there is about how scared we, we are very tense about bodily functions. And we weren't born tense about bodily functions. So young ones, they pretty pleased with their bodies generally, and they don't really understand why we're so uptight. And our uptightness around what's socially acceptable and what's not is quite, can be quite scary. So what they'll do is set up ways of laughing about it. And it's about them uh, releasing the fear. And when they can do that well enough, they'll then be able to make smart judgments about how to behave around that kind of tension, if that makes sense. So they're looking, kids are looking to laugh a lot. And I mean, adults are as well. And, you know, a lot of what passes for jokes are actually funny because they're about someone making some kind of mistake or about, um, 
some kind of thing where there's a lot of social tension. Now that can be about things that are um, oppressive, you know, um, people's skin color or their cultural background or the way they speak or whatever. But it's also about just um, various things in our society that we have come to think are normal and which young people, you know, look at and think, that's weird. I'll poke, I'll poke at that and try and get a laugh. So the, a good place to start with warming up your, um, your practice around laughing is to notice what makes them laugh. The other, there's, and then there's two other things about laughter. One is any place where you can be more stupid, more dumb, more cheerful about it, and they get to be the one who knows, the one who's in charge, the one who kind of is, is on top of things, that makes kids laugh. The reason it makes kids laugh is because adults are pretending all the time that they know everything, they're in charge of everything, and that's really wearing for young people. So when they see us, they know we're in charge, but when they see us ham it up it gives them a chance to laugh about how hard it is living in a world where people are acting like you don't know anything um, the other place where where you can reliably practice getting laughter going is what we call rough housing which is rough physical play you need to be careful that the children are in charge it's important that you judge um you judge how loose the laughter is if they start to scream it means you've gotten a bit big and they're actually now scared whereas before they were just releasing fear that's actually to do with old times where they got a bit scared so you you but physical play wrestling um i still wrestle i actually have to laugh a lot to wrestle with my daughter I actually get a good go out of it as well because these days she's pushing me to my physical limits um, and I'm on the edge of where I'm perhaps a little bit scared so we both laugh a lot um, but that rough physical play thumb wrestling elbow wrestling wrestling you don't want to overpower your child um, they really ultimately need to be the winner that's why tickling isn't a good thing but um, it's good to practice going after laughter at a time when they're not upset. Great questions. No, this is a, this is a, a great group. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think We've, that seems to be it, Madeline. I think that's I, good. We're nearly at the end of our time anyway. Yeah. So. Uh, well, I guess I can thank Madeline on behalf of Ramwick City Council and um, I'm sure the attendees have enjoyed your presentation and just the time that you put in um, responding to their questions. So thank you so much for that. My pleasure. Um, Madeline, did you want to um, say something before we end this um, workshop? Today? Um, you are fabulous. <laughs> Kimmy is fabulous and um, parents, you parents are. And I love to hear from you. So really do feel free to get in touch. Um, my website is www.madelinewinter, M-A-D-E-L-E-I-N-E, winter.com. And, you know, I'm happy to hear from you, happy to answer your questions. You know. There's your furry, what did you call them? Furry babies. My fur babies, yes, you can hear them. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> They're ready for lunch. <laughs> and it's, it's good the postman didn't come during this because they, they go off at the postman. It's, it's, it's tricky. <laughs> the whole home thing is interesting. <laughs> yeah. Again, thank you thank so you. much, Madeline. My pleasure. Um, and as you mentioned, the recording will be up um, as well. In, in will be sent to them as, as an while. email, but it will be up in a while. So yeah. you can listen okay. to it later as well. Great. Thank you, everyone. Have a have Thank a great you. day. Stay warm. Okay. Bye. Bye.